Hello, and welcome to The Search with Clint and Shahe. My name is Shahe Jurgen, and with me is Clinton de France. This is episode 10 of our Torah survey series, uh, but today's episode is going to be a little different than normal. Over the last two months, we have been surveying our way through the books of Genesis and Exodus. We've been focusing mostly on observational points, trying to draw out patterns, key concepts, themes, and uh, uh, integral components to the text that enable us then to move to that next step of the biblical interpretation process, which is interpretation itself, how to understand what these texts are trying to relay. But what we want to do in this episode is just take a brief pause before we move into the third book of the Bible, the book of Leviticus, to reflect back on the journey we've taken so far, to sort of re-examine and to check ourselves to make sure that the observations we've been making in Genesis and Exodus are in keeping with the purpose and theme of this program, and also maybe to critique ourselves to see if some of the key themes that we have been drawing from the text are, in fact, uh, provable and sustainable, and then to sort of reflect on how these themes might impact us as Christians in our theology, in the typological connections that the New Testament authors draw out of these Old Testament books. And so this is sort of a reflection and a re-examination episode. Now, I want to quickly just read uh, the purpose statement of the search again. This is something we covered in our episode zero, our introduction to the program, but I want to just reread this little purpose statement that Clint wrote for us, and uh, I'll ask Clint to sort of reflect on this purpose statement and to maybe talk us through how this purpose statement has been guiding us in our study thus far. So the purpose statement says, The purpose of this program is to explore the proper method of examining the Bible to discover its meaning. We believe that the meaning of Scripture is synonymous with the truth and that loyalty to Christ involves the relentless pursuit of that meaning, both to know it and to be transformed by it. Now, Clint, you explained a little bit about this purpose statement that you wrote in our inaugural episode, but let's come back to that and give us a little insight into your ideas behind the show, The Search, and how those ideas uh, have been coming out in our observations of Genesis and Exodus. Well, I think that the two fundamental parts of that uh, purpose statement are, first of all, that it is a search There is a methodology that you need to learn uh, in order to be successful. And that means that there's an element of humility that we have to begin this journey with. We, We don't intuitively know what the Bible says or what it means or how it applies to our lives. This takes effort on our parts. And there's a, a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. In fact, there's lots of wrong ways to do it. And probably only one right way to do it. But there is in this humility confidence because we do believe there is such a thing as truth and we believe that the true meaning of the scripture corresponds with the truth and that it has the power to change our lives, to enable us to know and to serve God and to participate in all the things that Jesus Christ has done and is doing and will do for the world according to God's purpose. So to me, that's the vital point of our purpose statement is that it is bringing together the humility of recognizing that we don't know everything and we do not know intuitively what the Bible is talking about. Uh, We have to work to get there, but also maintaining confidence that we can make genuine progress in that journey and that we can, with good, sound, reasoning, power, and judgment, uh, discover the right way forward. Yeah, that's very helpful for me, and that is really why we call this program The Search, Uh, In fact, I've had some people make those comments to me, people who've been following along with us and either watching us on YouTube or listening to the podcast, 
they've said to me, well, it really seems like that there are times where you or Clint are kind of surprised by something that the other person has said on the program. And I said, yeah, that's exactly right. I said, Clint and I talk about the Bible all the time, but uh, occasionally we surprise each other, in fact, quite regularly, because one of us has maybe made an observation or noticed something or digged into something for better understanding that the other hasn't. And so that mutual study, that community of believers who are working together to better understand the text of Scripture is so important, and that's really what we're trying to bring. We're trying to invite you all along with us as we go through this journey ourselves. Now, I want to make a comment about something Clint said because I think it might be um, a little bit concerning for some people. I think that there's a popular notion that the Bible should be a book that anyone can understand and should be a book that anyone can read and comprehend and maybe even with ease. And the logic goes, as I've heard from some people, that God is the author of the Bible. God knows how to communicate with his people, with his creation, with his image bearers. And so if God says something, it should be clear, and I should easily be able to understand it. And I think there may be a certain element of truth to that line of thinking if you were a member of the original audience that the Bible or the various writings of the Bible were sent to, were written for. What I mean by that is, Um, I, as a 21st century uh, English-speaking American living in the United States, am a very different person than an ancient Hebrew, than an Israelite living during the monarchical age of David and Solomon, or an Israelite who lived during the divided kingdom era, or certainly different than any of the Christians who were scattered around the Mediterranean world, be it Rome or Asia Minor or Palestine, or elsewhere. Uh, I speak a different language, and the Bible is written in a language that is not my native tongue, and in that original language, sometimes there's wordplay, sometimes there are idioms that I don't use, colloquialisms that I don't understand, there's a certain literary design to the Bible that the original audience would have understood immediately because that's the kind of literature they were accustomed to reading all the time if they had the ability to read or at least had heard. And uh, they spoke a different language. They had different worldviews. They had different cultural norms and mores that guided the way that they conducted themselves from day to day. They had a different, very different geographical setting. I mean, we go through the Bible and we read all kinds of place names, and unless you've brushed up on your biblical geography, you're not going to have any idea where these places are. It's not like when somebody talks to me about some city in California, oh yeah, I've been there, I know where that is. I know how long it takes to get there. I know what the roads are like between here and there. And so there's a lot that goes unspoken between me and someone having a conversation today about some place here in the state of California. I think maybe one of the examples of this, and uh, it's an example that is, I think, readily apparent, is one of the most difficult passages in all of the New Testament when Paul makes a statement in 1 Corinthians 15 about baptism for the dead. If you read commentators about what that was, you'll find dozens of interpretations because there was something that just was known between Paul and his audience, the Corinthian church, a church he knew well, that he could slip in this one little line about baptism for the dead, and they'd say, oh yeah, okay, yeah, we understand what you're trying to say here, and how this statement uh, relates to the broader discussion of the resurrection of the body, which is the theme of that chapter. So there are a number of extra steps that we have to take to get to where the original biblical audience would have already been in order for us then to receive, to understand, to comprehend, to interpret, and then to apply the biblical text to our own lives. Would you agree kind of with that summation, Clint, of the challenge of Bible study? Uh, Very much so. I've I've read different uh, books that are teaching us how to practice good biblical hermeneutics, and they talk about the the chasms or the oceans, or they use different kind of expanses, uh, dividing expanses to illustrate the space between us and the original. 
And there is an historical expanse. There is a theological expanse. There's a literary expanse. And you've talked about some of the other ones maybe that fit in there, but cultural and linguistic. Uh, one of my favorite Bible teachers, when commenting on the statement, the Bible was written for common people as opposed to scholars, he says, yeah, that's true. It was not written for scholars. It was not written for the intention of being just a book reserved for the academic world, but it was written for common people thousands of years ago in another right. place who spoke a different language. And in order for it to be accessible to common people in America, uh, scholars were necessary, whether we will acknowledge them or not. A lot of work has already been done for us, just to put it in our, our language, right. and to sort through the manuscripts and other things like that. And if we can acknowledge that we needed that, we needed that help, uh, we needed that work to make it accessible to us, then we shouldn't be too disturbed by the realization that there's still some more work for us to do, yeah. to continue to bridge those gaps and bring their world and our world together as much as we possibly can. I've been doing some studies in the book of Job, personally, and there's lots of little expressions that are used in Job by Job or his friends, or in one occasion, even by Satan. And nobody uses that expression today. It's, it's hard to know what it even means. I mean, for instance, at one point, jo uh, the devil says, Skin for skin. Well, it meant something to them, no doubt. And maybe we can sort of figure out basically what it means because there's a sort of a parallel structure to a, a clearer statement. But if that statement was left alone, we might really struggle. Well, what does that mean? It meant something to them. They knew what it meant. But we might not be able to figure it out, or at least not with great ease. Right. And that's just the way things are. Uh, there's no point pretending that that's not the case. That won't help us. It will help us greatly, however, if we'll acknowledge these issues and we will say, uh, what deserves work and effort more than understanding the Word of God? Absolutely. Uh, you know? Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I think that's a great segue then to take us to our next discussion point. So we've reflected a little bit on some things that we have been, um, had introduced some time ago about how to approach the Bible. We've talked about the inductive Bible study method on this program, how it starts with observation, and that's careful reading, not casual reading. Casual reading of the Bible is great, but there's also an occasion where careful reading is necessary. And that's kind of what we've been focusing on mostly in this program. Then that leads us to being prepared to interpret a text, to understand what it means. And only after we've made observations and developed a sound interpretation can we go to the third step, which is application. And we've not really talked so much about application on this program. We might more in the future, but for now we're sitting really in that observation segueing into interpretation uh, place in the process. But now what we want to do is reflect back on how this approach has taken us through the story of the Bible so far in its first two books, Genesis and Exodus. We have emphasized the importance of knowing the whole Bible story and seeing how each of the 66 different writings that make up the whole Bible contribute to that story. And the first two books of the Bible may contribute to that story more than almost any other book, uh, at least standing alone. And that is because Genesis and Exodus are extremely foundational in laying so much groundwork for what God has done and is continuing to do through and in his creation. So we notice at the beginning of Genesis that God created the universe. He created it for his glory. He made the earth, and on the earth, he placed his image bearers, Adam and Eve. And they were royal priests. They were royal because they were given the right to rule. They had dominion. They were priests. 
because they ministered in that sacred space within the garden where God himself walked among his image bearers. So these royal priests, Adam and Eve, were placed in the Garden of Eden. Their mission was to fill the whole earth with the knowledge and glory of God, to make more image bearers who knew, loved, and worshiped the Lord, and to take the blessings that they had in the Garden of Eden and to grow them so that the earth was encompassed with the glory and blessings of God. They chose a different path. They chose to reject God's authority, to rule on their own terms, and this is all manifested in their eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God cast them out of his presence, and uh, the presence of sin and death in the world can uh, start to have terrible consequences for humanity, violence and murder, and bloodshed, and rebellion. Things get worse and worse through the days of Cain and Abel, and Noah, and all the way to the Tower of Babel. And the Tower of Babel represents the apex of all human rebellion against God. And so God scatters the people, disinherits the nations, sends them off to their own devices. And finally, after we have a brief genealogy, we learn about Abram. God selects Abram to be the man through whom he will Bless all the families of the world. So he's sent the nations away for a time, but still has a plan to bring them back into a state of blessedness. We've talked about what that word blessing means. It means God enabling and equipping people to do the work, to do the mission that they were created to accomplish for his glory. So God works through Abram, through all of his family, through their dysfunction, their strife, their drama, uh, all the way to the end of Genesis, where the family of Abraham, led by Joseph, sojourns to Egypt, then Exodus opens. And the Israelites have grown in number, but they've also grown against the wishes of the Egyptian rulers, who now have turned uh, their disfavor towards the Israelites. The Egyptians inaugurate a policy where they try to quell the population growth. They start murdering babies. And it's at this time that God remembers the promise he made to Abraham. He raises up Moses to deliver the people. He makes his name known through the working of the plagues so that Israel will know the Lord, so that Egypt will know the Lord. He delivers his people across the Red Sea. He gives them the deliverance, the redemption that they so desperately needed. He brings them to Mount Sinai, and he enters into a covenant. He has now formed his holy nation, a nation that was supposed to be a kingdom of priests, and invited them into covenantal union with him. Now, they rebel. They build the golden calf, and they violate the first two commandments that God delivered to them. Moses is able to intercede on their behalf. He's able to make atonement for their wrongdoing. God, who at first wants to destroy them, then wants to reject his presence among them, relents and agrees to go with them. He indwells the tabernacle. He reveals to Moses his identity, and now uh, they are ready for God to be in their midst in the tabernacle, and all the ordinance of the, of the tabernacle are about to be implemented. More on that will come in the book of Leviticus. So this is the story of the Bible so far. This is where we are. Now, Clint, help us to reflect back as we've drawn out some of these major themes and concepts, I've, as we've tried to make observations, uh, what are some things that have stood out to you? Maybe some things that we've highlighted well, maybe some things that we've missed in the story as it stands uh, at this point. Well, early on in one of our first episodes, I proposed a model for approaching the Bible story that comes in uh, four parts and I called those creation, corruption, correction, and completion. Now, really, if you think about those logically, they are chronological. One leads to the other in time. But in the, in the, the biblical library, it would not be appropriate to think, okay, the first books of the scripture library deal with creation, and then here come some that deal with corruption, and then here's some that deal with correction, and here's some that deal with completion. That's not the way that it works. Rather, these four narratival streams are basically present 
through the whole Bible. Now, it's true that Genesis 1 and 2 focus on creation. Genesis 3 historically focuses on the event that led to corruption. But immediately at the end of Genesis 3, God begins his work of correction. And throughout the book of Genesis, as well, and especially in the book of Exodus, we see glimpses of God's intentions in the completion stage. What is God leading to in his corrective work? When we see these uh, reminders of Eden and sort of resurrections of the Garden of Eden in one form or another, here and there, over and over again, these, these signposts that are sort of alerting us to the fact that this story is leading back to Eden, back to the garden in a, in a very real way. And of course, if people are familiar with the Bible library on the whole, when we get to the book of Revelation, right. very profound. You know, many people have pointed out that what alerted them to the Bible as a story is that it has a beginning and an end and a middle. That's the essence of a story. And the beginning is in a garden. And at the end, you're basically back in that garden, in a sense. And you've got the same elements present from the uh, beginning at the end. And some people have pointed out, for instance, that there's no devil mentioned in the first two chapters of Genesis or the last two chapters of Revelation. And there's a lot we can say about that. I'm just bringing that up as a, as a point of how uh, this, this sense of creation, corruption, correction, and completion, it, it is chronological in one way, and that's really the, the, the most natural way of thinking of that. But on the other hand, it's just sort of woven all throughout the Scripture. You're, you're finding references to what God's original intentions were and what went wrong and how wrong it has gone and what God is doing to fix it and what fixing it is going to look like. And right. that has really stood out to me as we have worked through Genesis and now are starting to see the real shape of God's corrective work in his covenant with Israel, uh, where we're really starting to have the profound steps that are leading toward the coming of the Messiah. So one thing I would say is that uh, obviously there's a lot of material along the way that we've not paid attention to that's interesting and even meaningful and important. But one of the things that just sort of naturally happened in our discussion is we have tended to locate or at least attempted to locate the main theme of given narratives or sections of books. And that's a very important uh, thing to consider. It's possible to use the Bible as just a, a, a collection of pretty disjointed stories and events and you look at those stories and you, you draw good lessons, good principles to apply to your life out of them. And there's not anything necessarily wrong with that. To some degree, we're going to find New Testament writers doing that with right. Old Testament stories. But to do that responsibly, you have to first make sure that you understand the real meaning, the real central message of uh, the particular book or section of a book that you're reading. Application must follow interpretation, and interpretation must follow observation. And so in our observation of the text, we've been noting the themes and the concepts that are rising to the top, that are appearing over and over and over again, and letting those determine the shape of the, the Scripture and how we look at it and how we get to know it. And that's leading to our interpretations, which will pave the way eventually to application. hope that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely does. Uh, and I, I want to just emphasize, too, that um, uh, 
you know, especially as we read something like biblical narrative, which is mostly what we've seen so far, uh, most of Genesis is narrative, most of Exodus is narrative until we get to the law code section at Sinai or the instructions for building the tabernacle and the latter portion of the book. This will sort of change. We get to Leviticus. Leviticus is mostly uh, instructions and law code with a little bit of narrative. But by and large, what we've been discussing so far is biblical narrative. And reading biblical narrative is sometimes challenging because rarely in a narrative will we ever have divine commentary explaining what has just happened. So we read stories and we read narratives, and it's sort of like, you know, when I was growing up, the show Full House was very popular, and Full House was a 30-minute sitcom, and something would happen to the characters in the show, and at the end of the sitcom, it was very clear what the moral takeaway was from that program. This is the lesson you need to learn from what has just happened to these characters that you love and whose lives you've been following now for however long the show had been on the air. Well, that's not how the Bible works uh, most of the time. Um, because very rarely will we have a clear indication from a narrative that God will come down and say, this was good, this was bad, this is behavior worth repeating and replicating, this is behavior that needs to be avoided. The example that I I always use with people is the the very first story we read about Abraham in Genesis 12. He's just come to the promised land, God's made him all these promises, everything seems to be going really, really well, and then there's a famine. And during that famine, Abraham decides to go to Egypt, he gets down there, he lies to the Egyptians about his relational status with his wife, but what happens in that story? Well, nothing bad happens to Abraham. In fact, God plagues the Egyptians for trying to marry Sarai. And then when they leave, Egypt says, uh, the Egyptians say, here, here's a bunch of money and a bunch of livestock. Please never come back. I think it's the implication there. But he gets rich. Abraham gets rich. And he goes back up to Canaan, and now his uh, herds have doubled in size or, or whatever, and everything seems to be fine for him. He leaves a wake of destruction behind him in Egypt. And you could read that standalone incident in the life of Abraham and think, okay, well, there it is. Lying makes me wealthy. Lying is good. Abraham lied. Uh, He's a man of great faith, and therefore I should repeat and replicate this kind of behavior. Well, obviously that's incorrect. That would be a terrible way to interpret that story because you have to see that incident in the life of Abraham in connection to the greater narrative of his whole life story as it's presented in the book of Genesis. And what you find later is that a lot of bad things happen to Abraham because of that trip to Egypt. Bad things concerning Lot, bad things concerning Hagar, the Egyptian maidservant who they got when they were down there. All kinds of trouble comes to his life because of his sojourn there, his faithlessness in leaving the promised land during the famine, his lies and deception. So this is one piece of a larger narrative that the Bible is giving us to show, really, not to show behavior necessarily that we're to emulate or to reject, but to show the growth of the faith of this man that God has called to be the mediator of his future blessings upon the nations. So we do have to be careful about overly applying or jumping to the application part of our study. And I think that what I have tried to do, and I think Clint has tried to do the same too, is as we've gone through Genesis and Exodus, let's see as best we can with all of the ways we are separated from the original biblical audience, let's see what the authors are trying to teach us, what Moses here in this case is trying to teach us about God, about his work, about who he is. And we can develop from that theology, and we can develop from that practical applications, but we've got to start first with what does Genesis and Exodus teach us about the story of God and the story of his work in the world. Now, Clint, you mentioned we've talked about, you know, 
creation language or Eden terminology that comes back up in later passages, like I, I've made the case, tried to make the case as best I could about Sinai and the tabernacle being sort of recapitulations of what Eden was supposed to be. And now the tabernacle is sort of this mobile divine drama that the Israelites take with them and they can play out um, what has happened in the world, what God's intentions are for humanity, what sin has brought about, and how that has hindered the relationship that God is able to maintain between himself and his image bearers. How do we know if something is really a connection versus something that is just maybe derived by an active imagination. We, we see something, we think, ooh, maybe that's hearkening back to this or that's connected to this. And, you know, some people are very imaginative. My son is extremely imaginative, bizarrely imaginative sometimes. <laughs> and so, uh, so how, do we, how do we avoid that pitfall of making a connection or establishing a connection that isn't really there, even if we'd like it to be, versus allowing the text itself to weave that web of uh, design patterns or themes or some people like the word motifs that come up again and again in a natural way? This is a great and very important question. Uh, some time ago, I was reading a hermeneutics book, a biblical interpretation book. It's a newer book. And I saw something in it that I have seen in several other similar volumes, and that is an emphasis on the art of biblical interpretation as a companion to the science of biblical interpretation. Sometimes they'll say, yes, interpretation is a science, but it's also an art. And I think that's legitimate. I, I'm, I'm not denying that. But art is where imagination comes in. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you'll, you'll hear the warning, you know, don't let your imagination run wild. I never hear anybody say, don't let the science run wild now. <laughs> Cur curtail that science. Don't let it get out of control. Science has the, the more raw, data-driven, factual quality to it. And imagination or art is that uh, aspect that where, where creativity uh, can come into play, and it can be helpful, but it can also run wild. It can get out of control. So I think we have to have some scientific principles when we're reading and studying. When I'm talking about science, I don't mean biology or uh, chemistry, but I mean science in the classical sense of the term. Uh, and interpretation is a science. It is a, a systematic approach to knowledge. And so I think that we have to remember what are those fundamental scientific interpretive principles that need to govern us and fence us in and uh, curtail our you know, wandering imagination where we could just come up with something that sounds good but really doesn't have any basis in the author's intention because I think authorial intention has to be recognized as the source of meaning of a text. And in this case, in the case of the Bible, the author is ultimately God. So we want to know, well, what is God saying here? What did God intend in including these scriptures in his word or in giving this revelation? So we're talking particularly about making connections between one text and another, the formal term for this is intertextuality, intertextuality. And there are a few ways that you can make connections. And the most certain and uh, responsible is an explicit connection, where actually it's not you who make it, but it's the authors themselves who make it. Now, we especially see this in the New Testament, where New Testament writers will say, this happened so that it might be fulfilled, which was written in the book of the prophet Isaiah, and they, they point back to that. But even in the Old Testament, there is intertextuality and sometimes very explicit intertextuality, where one book will quote from another book or will refer back to an event that is recorded in another book. Uh, 
Now, the books of Genesis and Exodus were written by the same man. They were written by Moses. And one of the real strong, explicit connections that bind what's happening in Exodus to the creation event and to the concepts that are embedded in that event is the Sabbath day. If we look first at Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, we're going to see where Moses, in recording the creation, makes this comment. Genesis 2, 1 through 3, he says, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed, and all their hosts. And on the seventh day God completed his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which he had created and made. Now some people, when they read this text alone, they conclude that the Sabbath was what they call a creation ordinance, a law that predated the law of Moses and was originally given to Adam and has been present as a fundamental part of human existence that we should rest one day in seven uh, since the, the dawn of time. I don't think that's a responsible and accurate way of reading the passage. Uh, if we go to Exodus chapter 20 and verse 11, we're going to see when and how God properly sanctified the seventh day. When he's giving the Ten Commandments, he says, Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. And then in verse 11, he says, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Here is an explicit connection between a principle that is introduced in the law of Moses, and we, we've already seen the narratives where it's clear that they didn't know about the Sabbath before they went out to wander uh, outside of Egypt. It was introduced to them, and the ordinance is explained as basically an illustration of and a hearkening back to God's work in creation. And they are participating in a, sort of a signification or a memorial of what God did in creation to mark them out as the people of God. And this becomes the sign of their covenant with God, according to Exodus 31 and verse 13. So, the, the, the value and the importance here is that we have an explicit connection. We didn't just observe this, but it was inescapable. Moses states it in the most certain and uh, clear terms. Right. Now, when statements like this are made, when there are explicit connections, then we can begin to observe compelling similarities that might otherwise we wouldn't have missed them because they're compelling, meaning that they, they, they call us to notice them. They're like a big mm -hmm. red flag or one of those flailing inflatable arm people on the side <laughs> of the, the road. You know, you can't miss them. Oh, you no, think, well, certainly what, not. <laughs> what's going on over there? And we would have asked that. We would have said, what's going on over here? This is, this is something. But it, were it not for that explicit connection, we might not have been as sure as we are now. One compelling connection would be the fact that the lampstand in the holy place mm. looked like a tree. Now, that's right. odd. Uh, not all lamps look like trees, but this one did. Let's look at Exodus 25, 33 through 34. Exodus 25, 33 through 34. Three cups shall be shaped like almond blossoms in the one branch a bulb and a flower, and three cups shaped like almond blossoms in the other branch, a bulb and a flower, for the six branches going out of the lampstand. So we've got blossoms and branches and bulbs and flowers, uh, a tree-like lamp. And that's interesting. That's odd. That sort of jumps out to us. Then when the, the curtain mm. that... Uh, blocked the outside court entrance into the holy place and then separated right. the holy place from the most holy place, 
it was decorated with cherubim. Let's look at Exodus 26, 31. Exodus 26, 31 says, You shall make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet material and fine twisted linen. It shall be made with cherubim, the work of a skillful workman. Now, to my knowledge, this is the, you know, we, we, there are cherubim on the Ark of the Covenant, but we've got cherubim here guarding a doorway, cherubim at the gate. Yeah. And this really reminds us in a, in a profound, compelling way of Genesis 3.24. When Adam and Eve are driven out of the garden, and the Bible says that the Lord placed a flaming sword at the entrance of the garden. Uh, it says here that he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword, which turns every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. So cherubim as guardians of the gate, and then you've got a tree-shaped lamp. Uh, we're really getting some strong, compelling connections between the tabernacle and Eden here. And once you have these compelling connections combined with the explicit connections, then you have this context where it is appropriate to observe something and say, well, that's noteworthy. It may not be compelling. There, there could have been many other ways to read this, and it could have easily been missed. But now that I, I see all this other stuff, this is noteworthy. For instance, the morning and evening sacrifices that you pointed out and observed them as creation language. Well, the reason you can see that as creation language is because of the context that explicit connections and compelling connections have built for you. I think that the structure of the tabernacle, Sinai, and the Garden of Eden, now, once you see it, it is compelling, but I've yeah. missed it many, many times that yeah. I've read through the, the scriptures before. Uh, but I think that it's important to acknowledge there is a distinction between the explicit, the compelling, and the noteworthy, but as long as you take that journey in its proper sequence, then by the time you get to note where the observations, uh, that you, you can be pretty confident. I'm not just being creative. I'm not just using my imagination here, but I'm seeing these things for a reason. So I guess my question for you would be, uh, how, how do we protect ourselves? And I don't know if that's the right terminology to use, but how do we try to guard against becoming so overly imaginative and creative that we steer things maybe off in a way that the text does not naturally indicate. So, um, for example, when we were talking about the, um, the tests that God tested the Israelites after the Red Sea crossing, one of the observations that I made was that they go out into the desert for three days, and after three days in the desert, they start to complain about water. And I said, oh, three days. That reminded me, and my as I was reading through that in preparing for our discussion, it reminded me of Abraham, who journeyed to Mount Moriah for three days. And so it seems like three days after three days of a journey, there's a test involved. Now, I said, when we talked about it, I can't remember exactly how I said it, but I said, oh, this seems like maybe there's a correlation here. There's three days, there's testing in both of these texts. Abraham succeeds, it seems, in his test, and the Israelites fail in their test. Uh, we've made observations before about the number 40, 40 days and 40 nights in the Bible, that Noah, uh, it says in, in the story of the flood that was raining for 40 days and 40 nights. And Moses goes up into the glory cloud, and he's there for 40 days and 40 nights. And while he's up there, the Israelites are failing another test by building the golden calf with uh, the, the pressure that they mount on Aaron. So we sometimes don't have the clear connection like with the Sabbath, but we have these possible connections. So how should we talk about that, and how can we sort of guard against maybe taking these things too far to then applying something into the text that's just not there? Well, I think other than other than being careful to uh, 
you know, recognize the proper sequence here of searching first for explicit connections and distinguishing between the compelling and the noteworthy. Remember, compelling means you can't miss it. Mm-hmm. You don't always know what it means, but it's it's odd. It's outstanding. You can't miss it. Uh, and then noteworthy is a, is a step down from there. It's not meaningless. We're not saying that this is not worthy of mention. That's It's the opposite. It is noteworthy. It is worthy of mention. But I think one thing that you can do is you can be careful with your language. I yeah. think that all of us, as, as teachers especially, need to be careful with our language. We need to know that to say this this is what this text means. This is how it is. This, this was what Moses was intending to get across. That, those are absolute statements. And yeah. sometimes absolute statements are not becoming. Sometimes the best you can do is to say, well, this is interesting. And possibly this is what it means. Now, that takes a little bit longer, but it's worth it. It's worth it because it protects you from dogmatism. It keeps you in a position where if you need to be corrected, you can be corrected. If you need to see right. more than you're seeing, you can. If you need to see less than you're seeing, you yeah. can. I have, I've, I've read so many cases where people make a, a rule and then they, they give exception after exception after exception. And I think... When well, they man, really just need to change the rule. <laughs> yeah. Is it even a rule anymore? Uh, and, and I've been very struck by that so many times, especially in theological work. And one of the most (laughs) egregious cases, I mean, I've heard a lot of egregious cases of bold assertions that uh, were treated as, you know, compelling observations or maybe even explicit, like this is inescapable. If you don't know this, it's just because you're ignorant. When in fact, it was arguable whether it's even noteworthy honestly, mm. whether whether this is even legitimate. For instance, uh, Mark Moore is a scholar you're aware of, and mm-hmm. I like Mark Moore. I learned a lot from him. I have learned a lot from him, and I, I do. Every time I read him, I find him to be very, very uh, thoughtful and valuable commentator on the Scripture. But I was listening to a lecture by him recently where he talked about the number seven, as it appears several times in the book of Revelation and uh, pointing out uh, groups of seven similar to some of the groups of seven you've been pointing out. But he made this statement. He said the reason that seven was an important number to Jesus and to the Apostle John is because it's a combination of three and four. And three is the number of God and four is the number of man. And so seven is a picture of God working with man. Now, seven is also a combination of two and five. <laughs> one and six. Or of one and six. I mean, it's, it's, seven is a combination of several different numbers. It's a combination of seven and, and zero. I mean, uh-huh. there's, there's any number of, of algorithms you could use uh, to, to allege the significance, the underlying significance of the number seven Right. And furthermore, where does he get the idea that three is the number yeah. of God? And or that, that four, four is the number, the number of, man. of man. Right. Yeah. Now, th- there are uh, different scholars, Jewish and Christian throughout time, who have just put out there a mystical meaning in different numbers. And this has been very popular in Bible study, biblical numerology, uh, and there's a sense in which numerology is a legitimate part of, of Bible study because numbers do play a role in the Bible. There are uh, census numbers, there are lifespan numbers, there are reigns of kings that are numbered. There are numbers that do, as you pointed out, they seem to have patterns connected to them. But sometimes it can be really difficult to put in words precisely what that pattern means. And symbolic or more properly speaking mystical meaning behind numbers is something that just has never been conclusively established by bible scholars and there's no evidence that anyone even thought about it back before the uh, rabbinic and post-apostolic age Mm -hmm. of biblical interpretation 
And I would recommend an exceptional book on that subject called Biblical Numerology by John Davis. It's a really good book. I read it uh, a couple of months ago and benefited a lot from it. But I think that, you know, Moore's big problem was not in his suggestion. It was in his language. Because he said, the reason the number seven is important to Jesus is because it is a combination of three and four. Now, it would have been... a, a it would have taken him longer to say, some people suggest that the number three represents deity and the number four represents humanity. And of course, when you put three and four together, you get seven. So it's possible mm -hmm. that seven uh, is important to Jesus because it is a combination of these two numbers. Now, that's kind of a weak statement, of course. There's a lot of could be's and it's possibles in there and virtually no certainty. So it would then behoove him to go prove it, you know, to, mm -hmm. to collect some evidence or some, some uh, supportive warrants or source material that could uh, lead someone to that conclusion and demonstrate that he's not just being creative and imaginative. But when you speak with such boldness and yeah. absoluteness, yeah. well, that's just irresponsible. That's just irresponsible, and, and I would strongly encourage us, whether we're preaching or whether we're just studying for ourselves, uh, temper your observations with humility, and that will help you as much as learning the scientific rules, maybe even more. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I totally agree with that, and, and if I've ever overstated in this series, I, I apologize. It's not my intention at all, and, and I'm glad that you have brought the, up about the numbers, or that we've been talking about the numbers, because I also want to make sure that our audience knows that we, we are not in the game of what some people call gematria, which is where you can use Bible numbers to unlock some sort of secret code. You know, when I make observations about three or 40 or seven or 10 or 12, or some of these numbers that seem to come up again and again in the Bible, it's usually because I, I think it seems that Moses or some biblical author is trying to draw your attention to something. Hey, look at this. This happens over a period of 40 days and 40 nights. Yeah, exactly. And so you need to you need to wake up because there's something going on here that is something you've seen before and you might see again and this is what you need to know about it. And so uh, I think that's was helpful for me. You know, I talked about how um, it's the the phrase that the name of the Lord would be made known is repeated seven times through the plague cycle. Obviously, this is a very important theme that relates to the plagues and relates to the Exodus or Moses ascending and descending the mountain seven times, these kinds of things. It's not that there's some kind of secret code involved here. It's just a highlight. It's an emphasis. It's a way that uh, this literature is designed to draw your attention to something important. Now, one last thing, Clint, I, I would like for us to discuss before we go, and that is we have focused, as I said at the start of this episode, mostly on observation. We ventured sometimes into a little interpretation but we really haven't talked much about application and how the themes and concepts we've tried to draw out from Genesis and Exodus might impact us as Christians in our theology, in our typology, something that's very important in like the book of Hebrews relating to the tabernacle, uh, or even in terms of practical Christian living. So with the last few minutes we have with today's program, maybe just sort of explore how these themes might impact some of those uh, practical measures and uh, what are some key takeaways at this juncture in our Bible survey. That's, uh, yes, I, I would love to do that. I love talking about the typology of the tabernacle. For those who know me, uh, you may remember that one of my sermons that I preached all over the United States uh, several years ago was my tabernacle sermon. I had a bed sheet with a tabernacle chart on it, and I preached that everywhere. And I enjoyed it, and uh, people were brought to faith in Christ and baptized, and sometimes whole churches were established in large part through the simplicity of that presentation of the gospel, the gospel in the symbols and images and shadows and types 
of the tabernacle. Now that's not irresponsible to say that the tabernacle is a picture of Jesus Christ. The New Testament says that explicitly in passages like Hebrews chapter 9, which we read uh, in our last study. We looked at that text, which said those things were symbolic for the present time. But what do the symbols mean? Can we pull up a, a, a picture of the tabernacle chart here? Yep, absolutely. I can sort of work through it a little bit. In my sermon, I point out that there are three groups of three, and we can see them here before us. There are three areas, the outer court, the holy place, and the holiest of holies. It may be difficult to see in the, uh, the, the chart here because it looks like there's no roof on the internal tabernacle there, but there is. There were several coverings. So there are three sources of light. The sunlight illuminated the courtyard, but it didn't reach into the holy place. Only the menorah illuminated the holy place, but the menorah didn't reach into the holiest of holies. Only the presence of God, called the Shekinah in this uh, chart, and you can see it sort of glowing there over the tabernacle, only that illuminated the holiest of holies. And then you can see in the three areas, three groups of furniture, the bronze altar of burnt offerings, the laver, which is a pool of water, the table of showbread, the menorah, and the golden altar of incense in the holy place, and then the Ark of the Covenant in the holiest of holies. And I have pointed out that all of these things seem to have symbolic meaning. The holiest of holies is explicitly said in the book of Hebrews to be a picture of the dwelling place of God in heaven. And so the holy place it seems to be a picture of the church, the dwelling place of God on earth. And there's a reason for that. Uh, many times New Testament writers call the church the temple of God and the house of God. And the things that we find in the holy place, the table of showbread, really reminds us of the Lord's table, the, the communion service, where you've got loaves of unleavened bread on this table, 12, one for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And on the Lord's table, you have the one loaf representing the one body of Jesus Christ. We who are many are one body because we all partake of the one loaf, says 1 Corinthians 10, 17. And then you've got the altar of incense, which is described, at least in the book of Revelation, as being the prayers of the saints. You've got the lampstand, and there's this continual connection throughout Scripture between the, uh, the revelation of the Spirit of God or the Word of God and light. The Word of God is compared to light. So you have these things, you've got priests ministering here in the holy place, and Christians are called a royal priesthood. Then you go out in the courtyard. Well, if the holy place is the church, I have traditionally and historically treated the courtyard as the world. And I've pointed out that uh, out there in the world, people have to go through the sacrifice, which is a picture of Jesus, and his sacrifice for us, the book of Hebrews makes that very clear. And then the laver, which I think is a picture of baptism. Uh, in fact, that very word for laver is used in Titus 3 and verse 5, where baptism is called the washing or the laver of regeneration. The laver that doesn't remove the filth of the flesh, but that removes sin from our conscience and makes us clean and pure so that we can begin a life of fruitful service to God. Now, what's interesting, there's a lot of other illustrations and, and lessons that we can draw from those pictures, but what's interesting is that the observation you made, uh, maybe in our last study, I guess it was, kind of challenges this presentation of tabernacle typology. Most of those connections that I've brought up they are explicitly made by the writers of Scripture themselves. The writers of Scripture say, we are priests. We are the new priesthood. The writers of Scripture make an explicit connection between the golden altar 
of incense and the prayers of the saints. They make right. an explicit connection between the laver and baptism. Right. Uh, they make an explicit connection between the bronze altar and the animal sacrifice there on the Day of Atonement and the high priest and Jesus. This is a major section of the book of Hebrews saying this was all a picture of Jesus. And I think that there are scriptures that make an explicit connection between the holy place and the church and between the holiest of holies and the dwelling place of God. But I don't know of any passage that makes an explicit connection between the courtyard and the world. That was an inference on my part. And you have challenged that in the, the comparative uh, models of Eden, Sinai, and the tabernacle, that the world, the, the vast unknown that is totally alienated from God, is the outside. Right. It's not Eden. It's not the base of the mountain. It's not the outer court. It's what's beyond those things. Yeah. The, the, it's, it's not even pictured. It's not featured in right. the, the threefold or fourfold structure. So that's very challenging to me, and I've been thinking about it, but I'm, I'm thinking, and here's, here's an example. Hopefully I'll be humble enough when I say this. It's possible, then, that the courtyard represents a... Uh, the change that happens in people when they come to faith, yeah. to, to trust and knowledge of the, the propositions concerning God and his son, Jesus Christ. It is by faith that we access the sacrifice of Christ. It is by faith that we enter into the waters of baptism and find purification from our sins. In fact, Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved and uh, he that does not believe will be condemned. So yeah. baptism without faith is impotent and vain and, and meaningless. So right. it's very possible that that's what the outer court symbolizes is uh, the knowledge of God. This is where people have come to know who God is. Yeah. But that's it. They don't that, have a covenantal sort of that, that, relationship with him. That transitional state, that transitional phase where people are coming to God and entering into uh, faith and covenant and relationship. And, and this, what's interesting here is that some of the old-time preachers whose sermons I based my sermon on and who, whose observations were you know, the, the stepping stone for me to make some of my own, they pointed out you got the three sources of light, and they said, well, the, the outermost source of light is nature. Then you've got the Bible, and then you've got the, the very presence of God, a personal encounter. You're, you're, you're in there with God, and your knowledge has no mediating factor. You're just there with him. Mm -hmm. So you know him as you yourself are known. Right. And that's interesting, and that may be right. That may be right, because uh, one can come to a knowledge of the one true God, you know, through nature. But maybe there's something more to it as well. I, I don't know. So yeah. this has raised some questions for me. I've got to think about it. Even this proposition that the courtyard represents uh, intellectual faith, well, that's a possibility, and it, it bears some thinking about. But uh, I think that this is part of the excitement of the search, it's thrilling. It's thrilling. We're never going to get tired of this and say, okay, well, we got it all figured out and I'm done now. There's no point continuing on anymore because uh, there are things that we will miss because of our weaknesses and our disconnect and our distance from the original source and, and audience. But if we keep working and we keep pressing forward, we're going to keep growing all the time. And we hope that you will continue in that search with us. Next week, we plan to begin our transition into the book of Leviticus. Leviticus is a scary book for a lot of Bible readers because there's some weird and sometimes gross stuff in it, uh, but it's there for a purpose, and we hope that we can explore why Leviticus discusses the things that it discusses, what the Israelites needed to know about God, about holiness, 
and about what it meant to be the people of God. So join us next week in that study. We bid you a good night. God bless, and we appreciate every one of you. We hope to see you next time.